A new British contender was revealed in 1949, the BRM, British Racing Motors. The successor to ERA, it too was the brainchild of Raymond May. The plan is to restore British racing prestige all over the world, and it's hoped that the new BRM will be in action during 1950. The BRM certainly looked and sounded impressive, with its very complex 16-cylinder supercharged engine. In 1950, huge crowds, over 100,000 expectant enthusiasts, turned up, queued up, and trudged to Silverstone for the British Grand Prix, the first race for the newly instigated Drivers' World Championship. Tens of thousands of the new motor racing public, many ex-servicemen, who found the sport an exciting release from the drab austerity of the times. Tea and wads for the groundlings. But the old Brooklyn's traditions were not quite submerged in the flood tide of popularity. With the right credentials, the right crowd was still distinctly uncrowded. Earl Howe reminisces with former Brooklyn's habitués in the enclosure. While six deep around the windswept circuit, the less favoured patiently wait. The King and Queen arrive, the first visit by a reigning British monarch to a motor race. Princess Margaret, too. The long-awaited BRM also arrived, not to race, but to be inspected by the royal guests in a tent. In the paddock, the Continental Grand Prix cars. The only British opposition, with BRM still lurking in the tent, an ERA to be driven by Bob Gerrard, seen here with his wife Joan, and the British Alta of 1939, the Swiss Baron de Graffenried, and a Siamese Prince Bira, both to drive Maseratis. But Prince or Commoner, they have little chance against the all-conquering Alpha in competition for the glittering prizes, which totals just £1,750. One British car which does make it to the track is the Sunbeam Talbot, which closes the course. And the first round of the 1950 Drivers' World Championship begins. In 1950, there is no safety road for the pits, so everyone hurries to clear the track. The straw bales, not Arnco, guard the corners. The fast hangar straight, with the original hangars still evident. Evident, too, the superiority of the Alphas. In the pits, an overheated Maserati comes in. It has its supercharger pressure raised to try to keep up with the Alphas. Water in, water out. Its race is run. The lone Alta, driven by the Irishman Kelly, comes in for a leisurely refuel. Dr Giuseppe Farina, relaxed and polished, leads the race. Filmed by Paul Wyand of Movietone, who captures the driving techniques of the time. Farina wins on the Alpha. Like many drivers of the time, Farina wears only a linen cap. When crash helmets are made compulsory, it is the drivers who object. I remember how difficult it was to make the helmet compulsory. For instance, Nino Farina was uh, when it didn't like it at all. And then he was very thankful to have worn when, when in the circuit of Turin he flew out and it was saved only with the, by the helmet. And uh, there was one incident in Monza Grand Prix. There was a Fangio uh, Farina in Bonetto with these cars starting on the first line. And they refused to start with the helmet. And we had to, the last moment, to penalize them or something. We couldn't, uh, of course, send them out. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the things. And the safety, well, we said, uh, the organizer gives you a track. You must go as fast as you can on the track. If you go out, it's your fault. And so, well, guardrails didn't exist, uh, being tied down uh, into cars didn't exist, uh, roll bars, nothing of the sort. Now our cars were not as low as they are today. And so when you were slipping out, as I did at the Crystal Palace, the car was overturning and you were pinned underneath. Later in 1950, the Alphas returned. Fangio was driving one against a one-and-a-half-litre Ferrari and a single BRM which arrived too late to practice 
so its driver, Raymond Sommer, had to complete a special lap to qualify. Which meant a start from the back row of the grid. Even so, expectations soared to fever pitch, and the revs rose as the flag fell. Sommer let in the clutch, and the transmission sheared. And that was the BRM's total involvement in the 1950 Silverstone Daily Express trophy, leaving the field clear for the all-conquering Italian Alphas. As the BRM was wheeled ignominiously away, people jeered and threw pennies at it, watched by a teenage Sterling Moss who was driving a Formula 2 HWM. HWM stood for Hesham and Walton Motors, a garage in Surrey. The cars were built there on a shoestring by John Heath and George Abacassis for Formula 2 races. The car was powered by a two-litre, four-cylinder, unsupercharged Alta with twin-choke carburettors. The engine developed 150 horsepower, giving the HWM a top speed of 140 miles per hour, far less than its Italian competitors. 37 years on, Sterling Moss is reunited with the HWM. No, it's about the right colour, but the seat is a lot better than I had, I'll tell you that. We didn't have a seat like that. Can I, can I drop it? The HWM gave Sterling his introduction to Grand Prix racing, but the car wasn't really competitive. They were uncompetitive because there was no money. I mean, John Heath, who was the, who was the man who was responsible for this, he had to take bits and pieces from other cars. I mean, this was a real bitzer. You know, the steering wheel came off one car and the, and the front suspension came off, I think it was standard Vanguard and the stub axles from another place. The wheels he did buy, the wheels were Italian special racing wheels and the brake drums were special, Alfin. But again, they came as a special bit and, and he assembled everything together to make a racing car. We used to get starting money for each race, which was then 200 pounds, which was not bad. Uh, we only raced every other week, roughly, in different places, Sable de Lome, Perigo, Meta, you know, all over Europe. And John gave me 25%, so it's £50 every two weeks, which was £25 a week, which meant if I travelled with him in his Sitchin and only ate the main dish of, a, of lunch and then stopped and bought fruit on the, on the way, you know, I could make it work. And, and that was part of the fun of it, you know, I mean... Um, you know, I didn't have money to spend. I mean, I didn't drink wine or anything like that. I mean, a big Coke, mineral water or something. But that was what racing was. And at that rate, I could just about keep going. Then occasionally we would do, we would win a race at Goodwood or we'd get a third or fourth. And then obviously I'd get 25%. Then the next year, I said to John, I think I've been with you and you would give me a race. He, he then, I got up to 33%, uh, a third of what we took, of, of the takings, not just starting money. And of course, as I was young, we're talking 19 years old, um, people read the name and, and so that was benefit to me and obviously you'd go around waving at people and then the next year they'd say my gosh he's popular we'd better pay him a bit more so the more people you could get to wave at you uh, the more the local um, people organizers thought that you were worth for the following year and then you go out from shall we say 200 to 350 maybe in 1951 formula 2 in which sterling had been racing the hwm was about to be upgraded the one and a half litre ferraris despite having the champion driver Alberto Ascari, had been unable to defeat the Alphas. Apart from this rare Ferrari win at Silverstone, when, in the absence of the Alpha team, Ascari literally took the flag. Enzo Ferrari, Wright, and his team manager Ugolini had noted that the relatively slow 4.5-litre unsupercharged French Lago Talbot often picked up places, simply because the economical big engines returned 10 miles to the gallon and did not, therefore, require as many fuel stops as the Alpha. 